This talk was given at the California Institute of Integral Studies on June 3rd, 1983. The speakers are Jack Cornfield and Roger Walsh. The topic, Buddhist Psychology and Western Psychotherapy. Once said by the California Institute of Integral Studies, together with the Kern Foundation. Uh, for those of you that may not know about the Institute, um, let me tell you just very briefly, it's a graduate school, an independent graduate school located here in San Francisco in the Noe Valley that offers degree programs, master's and doctoral degree programs in psychology, counseling, philosophy, and religion, all from a east-west integral perspective <clears throat> or largely transpersonal integral east-west perspective. And um, there are a uh, catalog and schedule of the Institute's program available at the door, which you're welcome to help yourself to. Um, this is the last but one uh, this year of this series of lectures, which are on basically the kinds of themes that the Institute is also involved in, East-West and Eastern themes. The last one will be in uh, July with Dr. Robin Skinner from London, a uh, Jungian analyst talking on uh, spirituality and psychotherapy. And today we have uh, Jack Cornfield and um, his background uh, is extremely interesting and extremely relevant to the whole field that we're interested in and many of you I know uh, have heard of him so I'll just very briefly tell you a little bit about about him and then also about the discussant Dr. Roger Walsh. The format that we follow is that the uh, main speaker will speak for about an hour and then uh, um, or so and then we'll have a, a, a brief uh, intermission or break and then uh, uh, the discussion, Dr. Walsh will uh, speak for uh, about half an hour or so, and then we can have open discussion and questions and answers and so forth. And uh, I understand at some point also Jack may uh, uh, take us through a meditation. Jack graduated from uh, Dartmouth uh, in uh, Asian and Chinese studies, and in 1967, went to the Orient, Thailand, Burma, and Laos, and uh, spent about six years there, both as a monk and a layman, studying uh, and practicing under a variety of Buddhist teachers and masters, and in fact, wrote a book called Living Buddhist Masters, um, based uh, in large, to a large extent on his experiences there. And in 1975, started a center in Barr, Massachusetts, with Joseph Goldstein, uh, a Vipassana meditation center which has acquired uh, a very high reputation for being one of the most um, intensive and high quality meditation teaching and retreat centers in this country or in the Western Hemisphere and now spends his time about half his time there and half teaching and traveling and giving retreats in other parts of the country including the West Coast and uh, I understand he has a new book also soon to come out with Shambhala called A Still Forest Pool. And his topic will be Buddhist meditation and Western psychotherapy. And uh, uh, I also want to go ahead and introduce uh, Roger Walsh, the discussant, uh, who will address you after the intermission. And Roger uh, is uh, from Australia, where he obtained both an MD degree and a PhD in psychophysiology uh, while also pursuing a part-time career in as a trapeze artist in circuses, uh, which is something that I only just discovered tonight to my great delight, and uh, did a psychiatric residency at Stanford after coming to this country, and is on the faculty in the psychiatry department at UC Irvine, Irvine and has uh, published uh, many, many articles in the theory and research of uh, Transpersonal Psychology and Psychiatry and its interface with various principles of meditation. He has been a student of meditation, primarily a student of the Vipassana meditation tradition. His, one of his, his primary teacher has in fact been Jack Cornfield, so that's another reason why we're particularly fortunate to have him here as a discussant tonight. He's the author, co-author of 
uh, two books. Uh, one uh, has become a kind of a classic in the field of transpersonal psychology, Beyond Ego, with Francis Vaughan. And another recently appeared, uh, co-authored with Dean Shapiro, Beyond Health and Normality. And I believe another one is also in the works on meditation research. Um, and uh, so that's Roger Walsh, and he'll be talking to us after the break. And I will now turn the microphone over. Uh, with great pleasure to Jack Cornfield, who will speak to us on Buddhist meditation and psychotherapy. Thank, Thank you, Ralph. Um, I should say as well that beside being a trapeze artist, uh, uh, Dr. Walsh also held the world high dive record uh, for jumping some enormous distance, I believe, off a bridge in Australia into into water a hundred and some feet below, after which he did his psychiatric residency at Stanford. <laughs> I think they were in the right order. Um, and my background also includes uh, a PhD in uh, clinical psychology that I did with the uh, Humanistic Psychology Institute here in San Francisco. Um, I'd like to speak to you tonight um, on this topic of Buddhist practice or meditation and psychotherapy. I'd like to speak to you as therapists, um, partly because I've discovered that almost everyone in California is a therapist. <laughs> or married to one, or supervising others. Um, and also because I'd like to make the point uh, right away that therapists are people, that we're all, as therapists, or with some interest in psychology, whether it's Eastern or Western psychology, um, we're really all in the same boat together. Um, we start, whether it's in Eastern meditation practice, whether one goes into a monastery or an ashram for training, or whether one comes to a, to a clinical therapeutic situation in the West, we start with the same basic problems. The problem in Sanskrit is called dukkha, or suffering, or sorrow, or, or inner pain, or neurosis, or difficulty, depression, um, identification, demoralization, some not feeling okay. And it's a tremendously important thing in, in Buddhist and Eastern psychology. Um, it's, it's considered the key for embarking on practice and the key for embarking on a discovery of something greater or higher for ourselves to acknowledge and see that there is sorrow in the world and that there's kinds of suffering in our own lives. And that in that regard, as as humans, whether we're therapists or in the psychology uh, field or game or not, um, it's pretty much the same. Uh, I'm going to read you something. It's a newspaper clipping, a letter from Lewis Tom, excuse me, from George Wald, who is a Nobel Prize winning biologist at Harvard. Do you remember a year or so ago when? Uh, or two when there were uh, talk about a sperm bank for Nobel laureates. Um, an irate woman wrote into the paper uh, after that saying that why should there just be a sperm bank? Should there not also be an egg bank? Um, and although this may seem like a non sequitur, you'll see that it's connected in a way. Uh, George Walds writes back, he says, you're absolutely right, Pauline. It takes an egg as well as a sperm to start a Nobel laureate. <laughs> Every one of them has had a mother as well as a father, and say all you want of fathers, their contribution to conception is really rather small. But I hope that you weren't seriously proposing an egg bank. I'm sure that you understand that the thought of it could appall you as well as it appalls me. By now, scientifically, and Nobel laureates aside, there isn't much in the way of starting it. There are technical problems, but nothing like as hard as involve the other kinds of breeder reactors. <laughs> but, but think of a man so vain as to insist on getting a superior egg from an egg bank. Then he has to fertilize it. And when it's fertilized, where does he go with it? To his wife? Here, dear, you can hear him saying, I just got this superior egg from an egg bank and just fertilized it myself. 
Will you take care of it? I've got eggs of my own to worry about, she answers. You know what you can do with your superior egg. Go rent a womb, and while you're at it, you better rent a room, too. You see, he says, it just won't work. The truth is that what one really needs is not Nobel laureates, but love. How do you think one gets to be a Nobel laureate? Wanting love, that's how. Wanting it so bad one works all the time and ends up a Nobel laureate. It's a consolation prize. What matters is love. Forget sperm banks and egg banks. Banks and love are incompatible. If you don't know that, you don't know bankers. So just practice loving. Love a Russian. You'd be surprised how easy it is and how it will brighten up your morning. Love, love whales. Love an Iranian, a Vietnamese. Not just here, there, every place. And then when you've gotten really good, he says, try something hard. Try loving some of our politicians in the nation's capital. That's an extraordinary statement, really. Nobel laureate is a consolation prize. And what one really wants, and if we look at what we really want in our lives and what we care about, more than anything else, it's to know love or to feel it, to be loved by people around us, to come into that connection or contact or union or completion that love brings. Now, in the Buddhist tradition, it's talked about that there are near enemies to these states of love or compassion or equanimity, the, the things that one hears about as being good to develop in psychotherapy or in meditation. The near enemy to love is attachment. The near enemy to compassion is pity. Near enemy to equanimity is indifference. Let me explain them for a moment. Now, I'll be using a number of different models tonight and then try and tie them together. Um, most of the models coming from the uh, bo traditional Buddhist psychology. The difference between love and attachment and why it's called a near enemy is that attachment masquerades as love. It arises um, and it feels like I love this person, I care about them, in fact I can't do without them, I want them to be there for me or not to change or not to move or not to leave me. It feels like love, the main difference is that attachment relates to something outside of ourselves in the realm of separation. That's apart from me and I need it or want it to feel good or complete or whole. Similarly, the near enemy to compassion is pity. Oh, that poor person. They're suffering. They're in pain. Isn't that too bad, you know? Gee, maybe I could help them in some way. And that's an attitude one can find in all kinds of helping professions and also very personally. Um, what that does again is the same thing. It functions to separate ourselves from that other person. They're different. They suffer. They're having trouble. We're really in it together. You know, we have eyes and ears together and we were born out of a mother's womb onto this strange blue-green planet hanging in space that we crawl around and if you could look from a big distance would it all look like we were doing something um, it feels important but it doesn't it looks like ants from when you get a little bit away from it all these millions and billions of human ants crawling around compassion comes or arises out of that recognition that someone else's pain is no different than our own that their loneliness or their fear their fear of dying their sorrow um, their insecurity, their depression, whatever it is, that we have that in ourselves if we look genuinely. And so the relationship then isn't, oh, that poor person, they're suffering and I don't, but, but to look and say, yeah, I understand that, I've touched that, I've felt that in myself. And the near enemy to equanimity is indifference. That's uh, in the... In the misunderstanding of spiritual tradition, one says, oh, I'm, I'm non-attached, you know, married today, divorced tomorrow, I have a job, well, it doesn't matter, I lose it, I don't do it, well, I'll get another one. It's sort of careless non-attachment. Indifference really means not caring about things, and it's a very different state of mind than equanimity. 
Because when indifference is there, one removes oneself again or separates oneself from the world and says, it doesn't matter what happens out there. Whereas equanimity is a is a quality of poise or balance or openness in the midst of, connected with our experience. So we start, as humans, with the same problem, with neurosis or fear or, or whatever our own mental pain and sorrow is in our lives. And we have the same capacities for love and compassion and equanimity. And we have the same capacity also for distortion of it, for pride, for attachment, for pity, for indifference. What does, what does Eastern psychology teach us in how to work with these different kind of mental states? All right, please listen closely because in the next three minutes I'm going to give you a summary of the 80 volumes of the Abhidharma, which is the <laughs> abstruse Buddhist psychology. It will save you a lot of time, so pay attention. There are six things that exist in our world, unless someone can come up with a seventh, but we'll, I'll put the six out. Sights, sounds, tastes, smells, bodily perceptions, and mental perceptions, which include thoughts and feelings and mental images and so forth. Does anyone have anything else in their world they'd like to add? It's not so complicated, really, is it? It seems very complicated some days in our relationship or our work or whatever, but it's really only a play of these six senses. Counting mine in Buddhist psychology is a sixth sense door. That's all you got. You get born in, you have these things at the end, and you have eyes and ears and sort of these toys to play with, and they have these things, these six things. Now, in Buddhist psychology, there is a concomitant quality called consciousness. And in, in this psychology, consciousness has a particular definition. Its definition is that quality of mind which knows an object. So there's six consciousness. Eye consciousness, which knows sight. And then a moment later, there'll be a sound, hello. And there'll be ear consciousness arising with that word that knows sound. And there's nose and tongue and body and mind consciousness, each arising together in the same moment as the object. So, so far, we have our world of the six senses of experience. We have the six knowings of it. Sight arises and we know it. That's the consciousness. A sound arises and we know it. There's a third element to the Abhidharma or Buddhist psychology, which comes in between those two, but I don't have three arms, so I'll hold up the middle one and you can pretend the other two are here. And this is, it should actually say on the back, mental factors. And what mental factors are in Buddhist psychology are qualities of mind that arise in each moment of consciousness and determine how we relate to it. So that in a moment of sight or seeing, there's eye consciousness and a sight, and there could be mental factors. There's three unskillful ones on top. Greed, which means we grasp the sight. I want to hold it. Or hatred. I don't like seeing that. Or I don't like hearing that or tasting or smelling that. Or delusion, which means that we're lost or we don't see it clearly or there's some kind of ignorance in relationship to it. And then there's a whole range. These three are called the root unskillful mental factors, but there are um, 28 of them, actually, which include, oh, fear and anxiety and depression and, and uh, worry and um, uh, all kinds of other things that come out of greed and hatred and delusion. Then, the other class of mental factors, the other major class, are the, what are called the skillful or positive ones. And they include generosity, which is the opposite of greed. It relates to something open-handedly, open-heartedly. Love, which is the opposite of hatred. Wisdom, which is the opposite of delusion. It sees clearly what that moment's experience is, of sight, of sound, of taste, of smell. And so all of meditation, all of Buddhist psychology, in a way, this is one way to sum it up, and in a sense you could see it as well for Western psychology, is simply a changing of the array of mental factors through meditation practice or various inner disciplines from 
uh, greed and fear and hatred and delusion arising in relation to sights. We grasp this and we hate that sound and we like that taste and we dislike that, that sensation and, and uh, changing those instead to the positive mental factors of love, of wisdom, of clear seeing, of generosity. And there are a whole lot of meditation exercises where when greed arises, it gets transformed into generosity, or when hatred arises, it gets transformed into love. It's that simple um, in one, one way of looking at it. And what's lovely about that, about the Abhidharma and Buddhist psychology, of that particular model is that it describes most every path of practice because it's not just doing Buddhist meditation but uh, the various kinds of psychotherapy one could be involved in or many other spiritual practices all work to change the attitude or the mental qualities which we bring <coughs> to our experience because you can't stop experience you always have sight, sound, taste, smell body and mental experiences and the knowing of them what can we change? What can change is how we relate to those experiences. Now, I want to use, I'm going to give about six quick models and then maybe I'll relate them together if I have time. Um, I've been given an hour and I might go over a little bit if I feel like it. <laughs> I'm, I, I had an argument with my girlfriend before I came here, so I'm not in a very good mood. But <laughs> sort of. I'll try not to take it out on you. <laughs> You know, one morning I was leading a retreat for 150 people and it was the closing morning and we always do a loving-kindness meditation for, for all these people. Um, uh, and so I was leading a loving-kindness meditation and my best meditation teacher voice, you know, close your eyes and oh, let your heart open and imagine someone that you love a lot and send them thoughts of love. And then I'd pause for people to do that. And in the pauses, I was thinking, God damn her. I, was, I had a fight with my girlfriend <laughs> that day, too. You know, I'm going to call her and tell her off. And then I'd say, and now imagine someone else that you love very much. You know, I'll get her. You know. Um, yes. I think that's very important. And it'll get tied in later in the talk. <laughs> Let's see. Let's see. Because but what the, the main difference is, is one's attitude even in relation to anger or other things. That it, that it doesn't have to be something that one heaps judgment and all these other things on top of. We'll get to that. All right. This model comes from a very well-known psychiatrist named Jerome Frank. He's one of the deans of American psychiatry, emeritus professor at Johns Hopkins, and one of the people who started group psychotherapy in this country in the 20s or 30s or something like that. And a, and a wonderful adventurer in consciousness. He's also been involved in all kinds of spiritual practices. And he was trying to figure out in all the kinds of therapy he'd seen, what were the things that made it work? What were the things that made people change? And so he wrote down three in an article that comes, if you'd like the reference, from the Henry Ford Hospital Journal of Medicine, 1978 or something like that. Um, Three things that he saw common to the many kinds of therapy he observed. The first was emotional arousal. That is to say, the place that we most get stuck and most often get stuck is in the realm of feelings. Anybody who's looked at themselves very much will see that. And it's real interesting in the basic process in beginning in therapy anyway, is to see um, that people are going on and on about their story, he said and she said, or whatever. And then if you look a little below the story and you feel, now what's going on? What are you feeling? Well, I'm angry, or I'm sad, or I'm hurt, or, or I really love that person and I want to touch him. There's something that's calling to be felt that keeps the record player going on at the story. And in the Buddhist psychology, there's something called the chain of dependent origination. And in dependent origination, the place where we get stuck most is attachment to feeling. And I won't present the model of dependent origination, but it's elegant. Anyone could look it up who's interested. So the first thing he saw was the necessity for emotional arousal that people get in touch with or see the feeling level where we most get caught. The second thing is enhancement of hopes. And that simply means someone comes in to see you 
And by their very coming in to see you as a meditation teacher, which I am at times, or as a therapist, or whatever you happen to do, it's like a statement that there's some possibility things can get better, that, that there's hope for something. And one feeds that hope in a genuine way by saying, yes, it is possible. You can get a less stuck or less identified or less neurotic or less fearful or whatever it happens to be. So it's enhancement of hopes. And the third was increased sense of self-mastery. That through the meditation discipline or through the speaking in therapy or the screaming of its primal scream or the breathing of its breath therapy or whatever it happens to be, you get a sense that you can pay attention to things that were previously fearful or difficult before, or you can meditate and experience things that um, might have been difficult or, or are new to you in some way that you can expand or open <coughs> your sense of yourself. And those things which were previously difficult or fearful get transmuted into something that's workable. And your, your sense of your own self-mastery, of your well-being grows. And I think this is a wonderful model because, again, you can plug in most any kind of meditation system and most kinds of psychotherapy to it and see that the common elements are similar. He also added a fourth one um, afterward. He said that the other element, and he didn't quite understand it because it's kind of mysterious, as I'm sure you under, understand, is the quality of love or hu love and humor that um, love whatever it is that we want so much. What is it? You know, it's really... Have we ever really looked at what love is? I'm not going to go off on that tangent right now, but it's, it's such a wonderful and mysterious quality that exists in this, this world, this planet, this universe. And love, or acceptance, or openness, or whatever you want to call it. No, thank you. Another chord. Um, love and humor, which is somehow related to love. It's that capacity to look at our predicament, our difficulty, and, and not be so identified, not be so caught up with it. That was the fourth of the things that Jerome Frank found was, was what allowed healing to take place. Um, there's a story about Mother Teresa who kind of illustrates it very well. Uh, someone was interviewing her, and I've had the opportunity to go and visit a number of times her places in Calcutta and to interview her also for National Public Radio and some journals and things. The person before me interviewed her, and she told about loving your neighbor as Jesus and seeing the suffering of the people in the streets as, as Jesus in his distressing disguise, Christ in his distressing disguise. And this person said, well, it's all okay for you to say, but you know, you're a nun and you've meditated a lot and you're not married, you don't have to work, you don't have a family, you know, it's, it's harder for us lay people. And she said, what do you mean? She said, I am too married. And she held up her ring, which nuns of her order wear, that's the symbolic marriage to Christ. And she said, and he can be very difficult. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not just... It's not just that it's difficult for you or me, and if Mother Teresa has difficulties. <laughs> and it's that quality that allows healing to take place, all right? Now, there's something else that this points to. Um, and that is that one wants to learn to move, whether it's in psychotherapy or in meditation, from the content, from the level of content to the level of process. Okay. Therapy doesn't go anywhere very much with the story. You know, people come in and they say, oh, it's real bad. I am cast as King Lear, you know, or whoever it happens to be in their drama. And it's just, you know, things are not going well. And they say, can you help me? I would really like to be Romeo, you know, or I want to be Juliet or whatever their thing is. And if you believe that and buy into the story, the very best that you can do for them is change one image that they're trying to live up to be to another image. I mean, and nobody can be an image. It sort of kills who you are, because who you are changes every day. And if you try even be something wonderful like Romeo or Juliet, um, it's like your inner spirit dies. It dies because your spirit has to be able to wake up each day and kind of figure out who you're going to be more than trying to imitate some story or some model. And so part of the process of 
meditation practice and psychotherapy is going from level, from a superficial level to deeper ones. First from the level of story, down to the level of what feelings are there, which keeps stories stuck and going round and around. You know the top ten tunes of this week. You, you find them in meditation, you find them driving, they're, they're kind of always playing. From story to feelings, from feelings generally to fears as well. What are we afraid of? Afraid of feelings, afraid of being angry, or afraid of being left, or being hurt. Or we, you know, we all have our particular tune that we play over. And underneath feelings usually are some kind of fear or other, or blocking them. And then deeper than that still is if you move from story to feelings, you can go from that in meditation or in therapy if it's done in a spiritual way to look at the very process or structure of mind and being itself. And what you start to see then is, first of all, that there are only six things playing, that all that seems like such a big deal is actually just these six things playing like a movie theater. You know, it's multiple sensory. It's not just sight and sound. You get a few more in there in this theater, but it's basically that. And then we go around and make a big deal about it. Or, and I don't mean to say that there isn't very genuine and heartfelt human suffering, but there's a capacity to see it on another level which transmutes it or changes it. Or if you look even more deeply, you start to see that all experience has what's called in Buddhism, Buddhist psychology, three common characteristics. They're called the three characteristics. The first is impermanence. That means that whatever you look at, if you look really deeply, is in change. Every moment, seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, thinking, planning, remembering, all the mental processes, you know, you want to be Romeo or Juliet or whatever you want to be? How could you be that? Has anybody got a, a sight or a sound or a feeling or a thought or a body perception to stay very long? They always change, don't they? They keep revolving and changing and moving. And so one of the very deep things that you get when you get a little quieter and you take time to look is that what seems solid, I and the other, create this solid world, is really very much impermanent. Every moment it's a flux of change. Now we don't like to look at it because impermanence means what else? There's a near enemy to these three things. The near enemy to impermanence is insecurity. You think, well, geez, if I really look, I'll see it is changing. If it's really changing, where can I stand? You know, where will I be safe if I really look? You won't be. <laughs> There's a safety that Alan Watts published a book about. He published lots of books, but this is a lovely title of one of his books. It's called The Wisdom of Insecurity. And that's the place of safety, of seeing that, I, I hate to tell you this, but in case you don't know, you will die, you will get old, you will probably get sick. Um, things that you love, that you're together with, you will be separated from things that you don't like, you will probably be joined with at some time. You know? That's sort of how it goes. Right? That leads to the second of the three characteristics, which is called suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Okay? Unsatisfactoriness means basically that because everything is in change, wherever you look at it, there's nothing that you can find satisfaction in. You get a pleasant taste, it's wonderful, and then it's gone. You know, where did it go? And then you have a pleasant sound, oh, that music, oh, then it's over. Where did it go? You know, or a pleasant body sensation, or a pleasant uh, smell, and then it's gone. Where does it go? It disappears. And so none of those things can you grasp and say, all right, here I'll be happy and it'll last. Not a person, not an experience, not a thing. So it's unsatisfactory. Its near enemy is pain. The near enemies mean why we don't want to look at it, okay? And the fact is, again, um, just like I was saying about, about death, really, um, being born on this planet, as you have somehow got yourself stuck to be, um, they tell you the bad news. There is light and dark, 
There is up and down. There is pleasure and pain. Okay? Is, and you can't not have them. You're on the wrong planet if you don't want them. You know? You get pain and you get pleasure. And they alternate. And, it's, and even if you got a lot of pleasure, do you ever really look at pleasure? You know, you're that wonderful taste or that wonderful sensation or something. And even right in the middle of it, there's something a little painful about it. <laughs> Did you really look? Because it's, it's going to go in a second. It's going to disappear. And even in things that are painful, if you look closely, there can be a certain amount of pleasure. They're interconnected. How can you separate light and dark and up and down? This is duality, folks. And you can relate to it in a non-dual way. We might get to that if enough time. But right now. Anyway, so there's, there's uh, unsatisfactoriness and there's pain. And the third of the three characteristics is selflessness, which means that none of it is me or mine or I. And our problem in neurosis or whatever, we, we identify with things. We say, this is my body, and then it gets old and we get pissed off because we don't want it to get old. Or these are my thoughts and I want them to be different. Or, you know, it's my city and I want them... And I don't mean not to take responsibility for living here, because that's an, another quality that we'll get to. But if you look genuinely at experience, it comes out of the void and it disappears into it. And that may sound mystical, but it's not. Okay? I say a word to you. I say the word roller coaster. Can you picture it with the cars on and everything? Can you imagine a roller coaster? Okay, fine. <coughs> I say that word, roller coaster, it communicated, it got into your ears through this vibration in your brain, did this thing and you made this picture. Nobody understands how that happens. No psychophysiologist. Nobody, by the way. It's all really mysterious. Roller coaster, okay. It's gone. That word is gone now. Where did it go? It disappeared. Elephant. Can you picture an elephant? All right, now I'll stop saying it and I'll say some other word. Gone. It's gone back with Alexander the Great and the pyramids, you know, and uh, George Washington chopping down the cherry tree, if he ever did. It all, this whole talk, I've talked half of the time I'm allowed this evening or so, it's gone. And this morning, where did that go for you? And last night's dreams and yesterday, it all disappears and the new stuff presents itself out of the void. It doesn't seem like it exactly, but it does. It's really extraordinary. So that's the third characteristic, that it's all changing, that you don't own it. You can't say, well, I'm that, because it all disappears. Now, my teacher, Ajahn Chah, used to say that um, there were two kinds of suffering, speaking about working with pain and unsatisfactoriness. Um, sort of a, a variation on suffering is grace theme. When I went to see him, he said, I hope you're not afraid to suffer. I said, I didn't come to suffer. I came to be a monk and learn to meditate and be happy. And he said, there are two kinds of suffering. There's that which leads to more suffering, which most people are involved in grasping and, and clinging, and that which leads to the end of suffering, which is basically our willingness to see that the world is up and down, light and dark, pleasure and pain. Um, and, and when he knew, when I began teaching some years ago, he kind of elbowed me one day and winked and he said, don't be afraid to let them suffer, you know. And it's a terribly important thing as a therapist or as a, a meditation teacher that people, people have a pain as part of your birthright as is a pleasure. And Mother Teresa was exquisite when I, last time I talked to her, she's saying, she said, you know, I don't know what the world would do without, without the constant offering that we make of suffering as well as our joy. That somehow it, it makes our life rich to have both parts, and to understand that in some way. All right, how does meditation fit into this? Since I don't have a lot of time and I move along. There are two basic flavors or, or two basic categories of meditation. One is the kind in which one makes the mind concentrated and still on a single object. It can be a mantra, it can be a light, it can be a visualization, it can be the breath, body sensation. And you get the mind very concentrated on that, and the thoughts stop, and the worries stop, and the body doesn't hurt, because you, all your attention is on that one point. And the fruit of it is lightness and peace of mind. It becomes very still, and clarity, and joy. Uh, it's wonderful. 
And there are all kinds of ways to do that. The other kind of meditation is meditation, um, which Vipassana meditation fits into, which pays attention to changing objects. Instead of trying to fix the mind on one point to get it quiet and calm, one meditates on the changing objects of experience, of seeing and hearing, smelling and tasting, all our different things as they happen. Zen is another one that does that. You sit and you pay attention to what's going on to you. There are many other meditation systems that, that do that. Now, that second kind trains awareness or attention or balance of mind in the midst of our activity. And it makes meditation that kind particularly like psychotherapy in that you allow your experience to happen and you practice changing your relationship to it by being attentive or mindful. What mindful? Mindful is such a kind of creepy, dull word. And it's a very important quality, actually. It should be mindful, fullness. Mindfulness means being there with your whole body and spirit and mind somehow together to experience, to be present. You know, we can walk in beautiful Golden Gate Park, la di da, it's a nice sun, sunny afternoon, and take a lovely walk through the park, and then you come back after your lunch hour to work, and did you have a nice walk? Yes. Was the park nice? It was beautiful. And if you really look, many of us will have been there about 5%. The other 95% is thinking, now when I get back, I've got to write that and call that person, and why did she say that, and he did this, and we're off someplace else. And mindfulness means the co developing the capacity to be here in a full or complete or present way, which can be trained in meditation, in dialogue, in psychotherapy. Hey, what's happening to you? Can you feel that? What's going on? What's your experience? You can learn to be more full or present with it. Um, all right, so hmm. what I want to present now is another model that builds on the quality of mindfulness. And for me, it's a really key one in understanding, again, the way that both meditation and psychotherapy work, relate to one another, and also how Eastern and Western things fit together a bit. This model is called the Seven Factors of Enlightenment. Okay? And these are seven qualities of mind like generosity, love, and wisdom. There's seven mental factors which in Buddhist psychology, when it's said when they're cultivated highly or developed well, they lead to enlightenment or awakening or liberation or freedom from being caught by sights and sounds and tastes and smells and all the things that, that we get stuck in. Okay, the first and primary quality is this quality of mindfulness which is opening to, allowing, seeing clearly, not judging. Mindfulness allows us to hear, to feel, to experience our judgments, our fears, our loneliness, our joys, our love, our excitement, our desires, all of these things without trying to change them. It has three functions. One, it sees clearly what's there without trying to change it. Secondly, it brings with it the rest of the factors of enlightenment, which I'll describe in a moment. And thirdly, it functions to balance the mind. So it's the central part of Vipassana practice, and it's also the central thing in Gestalt therapy. And it's the central thing, actually, if one understands it correctly, in psychoanalysis. Mindfulness means bringing attention or awareness to what one's experience is. Now, the other qualities of the factors of enlightenment, there are two, two uh, categories. Three of the remaining six are arousing <coughs> qualities, and three are stabilizing qualities. <coughs> the arousing ones are energy, investigation, and rapture. <coughs> energy, or effort, means what? It's very important in, in therapy or in practice. It means the effort or the energy to be aware, to pay attention. It doesn't mean the energy to change something or make yourself different or try and become some fantastic bodhisattva or any of that nonsense. It means simply to pay attention to what's true for you in that moment. Yeah, effort to be awake. And it grows, it's developed in therapy, it's developed in meditation practice, you see how it can build. Investigation in Sanskrit, Dharma Vijaya, is the or Pali, Dhamma Vijay, 
is the quality of mind that looks to see clearly what's happening. It's the quality of really noticing what's going on. And the third of the arousing qualities, or the factors of enlightenment, is rapture, or its other translation is interest. The word is piti in Pali, or priti in Sanskrit. Rapture and interest. What it means is it's the quality, if you're out in the desert and you've been walking for a long time, and you see an oasis, and you go, oh boy, you get very interested right away, what's over there, and what it will do for you. Rapture and interest is that quality of mind where you start becoming really interested and delighted to look into or see what your experience is. So energy or effort to pay attention, investigation, rapture and interest. And these three are balanced in the mind so that the mind becomes very steady. And when you look at something, you can really stay with it. The next factor of enlightenment is tranquility which is a peacefulness of mind. It's when the mind becomes peaceful and not, not uh, disturbed and agitated. And then the clarity comes with that peacefulness. And the third quality of the factors of enlightenment is that of equanimity or balance in relation to all of our changing experience. Now what's interesting about these factors of enlightenment in terms of Eastern Western psychology is that Eastern psychology is predominantly trained people, clinical psychology I'm talking about, in this side of it. These two are really balanced. You learn to look, you learn to investigate, you learn to pay attention um, and get interested and you bring the energy of awareness. That's Western psychotherapy. The Eastern tradition, if anything, has emphasized or perhaps overemphasized tranquility, concentration, getting very quiet and peaceful. Oh, I meditate, I'm getting so happy and peaceful, you know, and that's sort of the way it's talked about and experienced in many, many systems. The factors of enlightenment are beautiful because they say that for true awakening to occur, both of these sides, this is a marriage in a way of East and West, have to come together. There needs to be both a stabilizing and concentrating of the mind so that you can see deeper than just the shallow level of thoughts and the story level that we get caught in. To see really deeply into the structure of mind and consciousness and what it is requires concentration and tranquility. But it can't be that alone. It has to be co-joined with investigation and energy and, and rapture. And together then, those two aspects, in a meditation practice or in psychotherapy, however they're developed, you can do them in Sufi dancing if you do it properly, with attention and concentration and awareness, all of those allow one to focus the mind and then to see deeply and clearly. The key to all of it is mindfulness or awareness. And I'll tell you a secret, it's a very important one actually, and that is that mindfulness when it's deeply understood, is the same as love. It's a quality of mind which sees without wanting or trying to change or judge anything. Now the implications of some of what I've just said are, for one, that sitting in meditation or doing some meditation practice which develops these qualities of concentration and tranquility and equanimity and some mindfulness should help therapy. And what I've discovered, because I also work as a clinician, um, I teach a lot of large meditation retreats and people will come for 10 minute interviews and talk about what's happening in their meditation. And I've discovered that I can do sometimes more therapy in a deep way with somebody in 10 minutes in a retreat than in a lot of clinical hours outside. And I was trying to figure out why. And part of the reason was that as people sit, these retreats are like 10 days or two weeks, where you sit for eight hours a day, and in between each hour of sitting, you do a half an hour or 40 minutes of walking meditation, and you're silent, and you just pay attention to yourself. As you do, and the awareness builds, and the mind gets calmer and more tranquil, it's like the, the outer layers of busyness drop away, and you're, you become more open. Mindfulness gets stronger, tranquility gets stronger, the ability to listen inwardly gets stronger. And so someone comes in, in that state, and they're very ready to see in a deep way what a problem is, or what the source of some difficulty, or where they're attached or stuck in some way. 
Whereas when people come off the street for therapy, there's lots of time that takes to, to quiet down, to even get in touch with their body, to get through some of the, the more obvious defenses um, for building a sense of trust that develops over, over time in the meditation practice or openness. So my experience is that meditation in that sense can function as a, a very valuable complement to uh, psychotherapy. And I've also done workshops where I've had people sit for an hour and then we've done some uh, group therapy and then we sat again. And the sitting both allowed things to come up from a deeper level, paid attention to and then we worked with it. And it also gave a place for people to integrate or process the experiences that came up. The main shift in meditation and in psychotherapy is a shift of identification from taking something really seriously or being caught by it, that's on one hand if you do that, to some bigger perspective of it. And that may mean at times that you have to get back into it and feel it more fully, so it's not like you move away from it, but you let yourself feel it by, by making more space for it. And there's a much simpler model I'm going to hold up for a moment. It's from Suzuki Roshi's wonderful book, Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind. And he says there are really only two minds. And actually there's only one mind, but the one contains the other. There's big mind and small mind. Small mind is that quality in the mind of identification, of saying I'm this and I'm that and I want that and I don't like that. Of grasping one part of this changing process and saying it's I and I like or don't like it. And big mind says, yeah, that's all right. That's okay. It just lets it be. It makes space where you don't get caught in those identifications. Little mind tries to solve problems, and big mind transcends them or doesn't get, doesn't take them so seriously. Zen master Rinzai put it this way. He said, followers of the way, the one himself sitting right before your eyes, is one who enters fire without being burnt, goes into water without being drowned, and plays about in the three deepest hells as if in a fairground. He enters the world of ghosts and dumb animals without being molested by them. Why is this so? Because there is nothing he dislikes. If you love the sacred and dislike the worldly, you will go on floating and sinking in the ocean of birth and death. The passions arise depending on the heart. If the heart is stilled, why then need you fear the passions? Do not tire yourselves by making up discriminations, but concentrate on what you do just here and now, and quite naturally of itself, you will find the way. How can he go in all these places and not be troubled? Because there's nothing he dislikes. And the place that meditation or psychotherapy leads is to that capacity to open to the full range of experience. It doesn't mean not taking responsibility, because non-attachment and commitment are in very different ballparks. As I started to say earlier, people can abuse non-attachment, say, I'm not attached, and just run away from things. Commitment is a quality which says, I'm willing to be here, to take responsibility, as Carlos Castaneda says, to be impeccable as a warrior, to live in this world, in this incredible world, fully with each action, with each word, but to do it with a sense not of, not of grasping or of fear, but really of seeing the, the dance of it, the change of it. So that when you're in relationship, or you're in, you're in a job, if, uh, if you pretend to be non-attached, you, you have trouble in it, you say, well, I'll leave, I'll find a new one, a new job, a new partner, a better one. Commitment is that quality where you say, I'm willing to stay in this relationship. Not to say you might at some point not change, or I'm willing to stay in this job, but I'm not committed, not committed to hold on or to fix it in a certain way. The commitment has to be to awakening or to opening. I want to be together with you, your partner, or I want to work together in this situation, to grow, to open, to become more conscious to go through the ups and downs, through the difficulties, to take responsibility for all of that, but to do it from a commitment to opening rather than a commitment to grasping. Now, a couple more things. I have about ten more minutes, I think, that I'll, I'll use. Um, 
what does Buddhism have to teach Western psychology? You know, there are the 80 volumes of Abhidharma and the sutras and the, all the Buddhist, hundreds of different meditation techniques. There are, there are a dozen more quick models that I could show you of elegant things of how to work, from the mi- work with the mind from the Buddhist tradition. There's the model of the five hindrances, of the difficulties which arise in meditation practice, of desire and anger and sleepiness and restlessness and doubt, and how to deal with them or how to work with them. There's a wonderful story that kind of illustrates it. Of, actually, it's a Sufi story of Mullah Nasruddin. Um, he's traveling between the border of Persia and Turkey with his donkey every day. And the guards think that he's a smuggler because he looks kind of questionable and they stop him and they check him and they look, even the saddlebags they dump out and there's nothing there. They're looking for opium or jewels or something like that. They find nothing. Each day he goes across the border in the morning with his donkey and then he walks home at night and they find nothing. Get more and more suspicious, search him more, more thoroughly. One day, a border guard meets him in the bazaar in the marketplace in Turkey, and he says, you know, Mullah, he said, I've retired, and I don't work for them anymore, but I'm dying of curiosity. We know you are smuggling something. We just, we could tell. I mean, you're looking richer and more prosperous, and we searched you. We couldn't find it. If you tell me, I won't tell them, but please ease my curiosity. Just what was it you were smuggling? He said, simple, donkeys. (laughs) <laughs> the Buddhist model of the five hindrances most people come into meditation or psychotherapy or whatever and they get angry or they have desire or they have fear or they have restlessness or judgment and they think it's bad and actually it's the donkey it's the most obvious thing and what mindfulness or what meditation training is about is it teaches us how to work not with the opium of some wonderful mind state or the jewels of insight. They come and they go. They're really kind of cheap. It teaches us to work with the donkey, with the thing that's really happening. How to be aware of our fears or of our knee pain, of our back, of our aging, of our loss in relationship, of our whatever it happens to be with balance, with openness, with big mind. So there's a whole model about that. I won't say anything more about it. And there's another one, it used to be the five, but I changed it. Six ways of working with difficulties. Okay? Is this all right to throw this much information at you? <clears throat> you can always buy the tape later, maybe. Um, I get a percentage. Uh, okay, this is ways to work with difficulties as they arise in your meditation or in psychotherapy. The first and the easiest is to let go. And sometimes you can actually do it. Have you ever had the experience something that's difficult arises and, oh, it's terrible, whatever, and you look at it and you say, I'm just going to let go of it. And not suppress it or repress it or anything, but you really just let go of it. Have you ever had that moment? I'm sure you have. It's a wonderful capacity we have. So that's the best way, or the easiest. They get more difficult and also a little more karmically tricky as we go down the list here. But That's the simplest one. Now, if you can't let go, the next level, the next easy thing to do is to let it be. What's the difference? Well, let go means you let go and also it disappears. Let it be and let go and let be are both aspects of mindfulness. Is that you're angry or you're sad or you're caught up or whatever, and you say, okay, I'm angry, I'm sad, I'm caught up. And you just let it be there and you don't want it to go away and you don't try and change it. And then what does it do if you let it be? Anybody got an idea? Eventually it goes away because nothing stays, you know, okay. So that's a pretty simple way too, of letting things work themselves out. Now, then the other ones. Suppression, that's a useful one. What? You say suppression is useful? We're supposed to not do that. There are times when it's helpful, okay? I'll give you an example. Suppose that Judith is a surgeon. Okay, she's on call now. She's at home and she's having a fight with her husband or her boyfriend. Just imagine that, you know, and they're really into it. And her beeper goes off, beep, beep, get in the car, run to the hospital, time for open heart surgery. (laughs) That is a very good time to put aside 
all the stuff with her boyfriend or her husband, whoever, and do the surgery, you know, leave that alone. So suppression has its functions. They're appropriate or safe or skillful or good times to work on stuff that's difficult. Sublimation. I think I have them reversed, actually, these two. It doesn't matter. Sublimation means, you know, both it can be outer and inner. You, you can be angry and you can sublimate physically by going and chopping your winter's firewood and getting out some of your anger. And I, I study a little bit of Aikido and, and Aikido sword play, and I found that really useful when I get angry sometimes. Not always, but... Um, or inner sublimation. You can take, for example, grass.